It means that signal. We need more power. Here I am at the Flying Frog Productions booth, and I actually get to be on camera for a few seconds. <laughs> Thanks to Scott Hill. Hello again, everybody. We're going to find out what Flying Frog has got in the works and what they brought here to Gen Con, and that's all I got. <laughs> Let's go talk to Scott. Scott, thank you for joining me, and I see that, once again, the Flying Frog booth is pretty packed. <laughs> <laughs> it's been crazy, but you know, we, it's our kind of crazy. We love it. Uh, Gen Con is so much fun. But, you know, most of the year we have our, our nose to the grindstone and we're just, you know, head down working on stuff. But we come here and people are like, oh, this one time we were playing this game and then it came down to the last turn and it was a nail biter. And we're like, yes, yes. And it's so much fun. It jazzes us. We get pumped up and, and that carries us through to the next year, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's. When, when it's like five o'clock in the morning and we haven't slept in days and we're like still <laughs> toiling away trying to meet a deadline, that's the kind of stuff that we find down deep when we have to dig, you know, and, and find a reason to, to, to keep going. So it means a lot to us to come to Gen Con and, and meet everybody and, and find out what they're doing and, and how they like the games and all that stuff. So all right, I can't believe you guys go back and play more games at night. <laughs> I can't either. We really should be sleeping, but... Uh, but, you know, we're gamers, and uh, you don't always think with your head. It's more with your gamer heart. And uh, right. my heart says stay up all night game, even at Gen Con, you know. Well, what has Flying Frog brought along to Gen Con here that they're debuting? Right. Well, uh, so Gen Con for us is like our biggest event of the year. And so right. everything is geared toward it. Last year at Gen Con, we wrapped it up. We're on the plane home and we start talking about next year's Gen Con. And that's that's kind of our philosophy and how we take it. So we want to make it like as exciting and cool as possible. And what that means to our fans and gamers uh, is that we want to try to have like early versions of products and pre-orders and reveals and demos and meeting characters from the games and all that stuff. It's really important to us to provide an experience. So they're like, the, the Flying Frog booth was the most fun I had the entire Gen Con. We try really hard for that kind of thing. So to that end, we actually, uh, for our two new Fortune and Glory expansions, we've got uh, Rise of the Crimson Hand and Treasure Hunters. This one comes out in stores in September. Rise of the Crimson Hand. Treasure Hunters should be in stores in November, but we actually got early copies printed up and air freighted at great expense to Gen Con. So, the Order of the Crimson Hand, you already saw those in A Touch of Evil and in Fortune and Glory, but we've uh, up updated them to be a full-fledged vile organization. Okay. So that means now uh, they already had the Nazis and the Mafia, now we have the, the uh, Order of the Crimson Hand as well. Uh -huh. So they're not only a vile organization, but they have their own new villains with their own miniatures and stuff, so villain characters. Uh, and they have a, uh, a standard troop type, the uh, Acolyte. And the Acolytes, the uh, Order of the Crimson Hand Acolytes, basically come out and go on to different treasures and race you for the artifacts. So it sort of ups the ante and, uh, and adds a little bit of stress to the players when they're fighting against the Order of the Crimson Hand. Besides that, we also added a new um, big city event chart. And so what that means is, whenever you're in a major city, uh, you, uh, you draw a city card. And if you get that city card that says, just another day in the city, it used to mean it's kind of a push. Nothing happens, shuffle the deck. Now it means roll on the major city epic event chart. And we have a, a specialized uh, themed chart to every single major city on the entire really? board. And nice. so it gets more of that flavor. If you're in San Francisco, there might be an earthquake that breaks out. If you're in New York, it might be the World's Fair that happens. So it's themed per city all over the world. That it's a lot cool. of fun. You know, that reminds me of games like back in the day that I would play that had these charts where you would have to roll to see the, like if a critical hit happens, you roll on the critical hit chart and then you pop yes. somebody's arm off. You know what? I know exactly cool. what you're talking yeah. about. We used to love it. We'd play... Um, uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, yeah. and there was a critical hit chart where you could lop off heads, or it would be like, you pierced their left lung or something. We're like, yes! <laughs> we love that stuff. And so it's dripping with theme. That's exactly what we wanted for this. Nice. nice. Um, let me move on to Treasure Hunters. This yeah. one comes out to stores in November. It has four new heroes for the game. There's Jenny Butler, the Hollywood starlet. She's a young Hollywood actress, and she's kind of on a hunt for, for her missing brother. 
Uh, there's uh, Grant Jackson. He's a man of action and a soldier of fortune. And uh, total, total stud, basically. <laughs> We've got Angel Espinosa, the grease monkey. She's a, she's a mechanic extraordinaire. And uh, she's kind of like the good looking girl who's like a tomboy. So, uh, you know, she, uh, she might look like a model, but she, she would uh, definitely beat you up. <laughs> and lastly, but certainly not least, Nigel Harrington, the big game hunter. Now, he is a proper English gentleman who is ex-military, and sometimes he even uh, brandishes his pith helm and uh, an old-school British military uniform when he goes into battles or uh, hunting for treasure. <laughs> and this guy is amazing. This is not fake facial hair in any way. He's, uh, this is the genuine article. This man owned his own pith helm. He was a pleasure to really? work with. And uh, he's so awesome. He, he actually has been in um, in movies and stuff. He was in the Patriot. He was the the head of the British Brigadoons, and he led that uh, that horse. Well, he looks squad. the part, yeah. definitely. Absolutely. He actually does Wild West trick shooting shows. He does jousting. He owns his own armor. So we were oh working gosh. with him, and just all day it was just so much fun. Where he was pulling out these amazing uh, ancient weapons and things like that. Uh, besides the four new heroes. This also adds a new set of counters for the docks. So all the port cities on the board get these dock counters, and when you go to one, you flip it over and you can have different encounters. We found that that's a, a huge part of the pulp genre. Is there's always something nefarious going on down at the docks. So we wanted to add that. Another thing that this adds is the personal missions deck. And so it's a brand new deck of 20 personal mission cards. So besides your normal mission of punching out Nazis and spamming the globe trying to find uh, you know, fortune and glory while you're hunting down these artifacts and treasures, uh -huh. now you'll also have a secondary mission. Everybody has a personal mission that they draw at the start of the game, and it's secret. So uh, no one else knows your personal mission. And when you accomplish it, you get some bonus. It could be fortune, it could be glory, it could be some stats bonus. Um, but you get that, and then you get a new personal mission. So you'll uh -huh. always have a secondary mission, uh, an objective just for you. Uh, besides all of that, there's new cards for, for all the different decks and uh, two new mob villains, uh, Joey Smiles and Mickey the Hammer. And those guys are uh, kind of a tag team of, uh, of goons for the, for the mob. So lots of fun. Rise of the Crimson Hand, I should say, also has a ton of brand new cards for the game, new counters and all that stuff. Right. Both of these, they're equivalent. They have about the same amount of stuff. Uh, this one's more villain themed and this one's more hero themed. But uh, both fantastic, and they're going to be out in stores September and November. Okay. Oops. So, uh, next up, Blood in the Forest for uh, Last Night on Earth. So this one is uh, incredible fun. It's uh, it's a supplement or in a, uh, an expansion that'll be for uh, both the original Last Night on Earth or Timber Peak. But oh, it does okay. have a little bit more of that Timber Peak flavor, so uh, up in the in the uh, woods, in the mountains. So there's uh, brand new forest boards, both uh, L-shaped boards, new rectangular boards that fill in the gaps when you have a larger board. Oh, I'll really? explain that in a second. And a new center board. One side is all forest, the other side is the new airfield. And there's new scenarios that use the airfield, such as escape in the plane. Um, but with the new forest boards, we actually, you could play in all forest, you could replace some of your town L shapes with forest boards, or you can actually do a much larger board by having the, the regular town of, of Woodenvale or Timber Peak, and then add extra forest boards on the outskirts around, and then use these gap filler boards so that it makes one large square nice. board. Nice! And that is incredible There's fun. also brand new heroes. There's Sister Ophelia, and she's a, she's a nun, but she had kind of a rocky start in life, and she grew up uh, in kind of a violent neighborhood. So uh, she found peace up in the mountains uh, as a nun, but once the zombie apocalypse hit, old habits die hard, and she breaks out the shotgun. So we do have a, uh, a shotgun-toting nun. Yes, you heard it here. Uh, besides that, we also have Agent Carter, an FBI agent, who may know more than he's letting on about this zombie uh -huh. outbreak. So, uh, also, one of the coolest parts of this expansion is, for the first time, we add zombie champions. So, uh, just like we did in Invasion from Outer Space, where we have like the Zard Beast or the Martian Champion, yeah. these are kind of uh, characterful uh, zombies that you can get. So, 
Uh, we didn't want it to be anything too crazy and breaking the reality of the game because our games are very uh, cinematic and you know we wanted it to, to feel like it's a it's a reality based zombie experience. Uh -huh. But we have a giant like seven foot tall lumbering uh, lumberjack that has become a zombie, and so you have this terrifyingly. Andre the giant sized figure <laughs> still toting his running chainsaw uh, that you can get. It's called the zombie behemoth and the figure is giant and so uh, it's still within scale. It's just a very scary large Andre the giant sized right. guy. <laughs> That's the behemoth. There's also feral dead. The feral dead are zombies that um, that uh, basically have been out in the woods all this time so all they have to eat is like squirrels and things like that so they're starving. So the models themselves have very tattered clothes and uh, they're very emaciated and skeletal and they're so ferociously hungry that they're just savage and feral. So it makes them a lot more dead. Um, next up, I'll talk about Dark Gothic for A Touch of Evil. And, uh, and I should say, it's not really for A Touch of Evil because it takes place in the A Touch of Evil world, but it's not associated with the board game in any way. This is our first deck building game. So, uh, so one of the things that, uh, that we did that's very different is that uh, it's character based. So whenever you play, you take on the role of one of these characters. Now these are characters that we've pulled from all across all the expansions, everything we've ever done for, uh, for A Touch of Evil. And then there's some new characters that we're introducing that you may not have seen yet. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that's very unique is uh, whoever you're playing, they actually have unique abilities and they have a unique starting deck. So we have these, uh, these different stats here, combat, cunning, spirit, and honor. And then you'll get a different starting deck makeup depending on who you're playing. Oh, really? So it's a very oh, different experience. Um, besides that, you know that we're big fans of uh, American-style games. All of our games are, are fun beer and pretzel romps. Um, and so, of course, we had to add a die into the mix. <laughs> so there's a custom die that comes with this. And it has the numbers uh, one, two, three, four, and then two skulls. We call it the omen die. And a lot of the cards will have you uh, roll dice to uh, to determine what happens. So it might be like this card lets you draw two cards and then roll the omen die. And if you get a skull, you have to discard it. That kind of thing. Besides that, actually, we took a different direction with our villains, where we did illustrated villains. And uh, we were we were fortunate to work with uh, one of our favorite uh, illustrators, Brian Snowdy. He's been in the industry forever. He's one of the original magic artists, and we really really love his art style. And he did these fantastic illustrations for the for the villains. And uh, one of the things this allows us to do is instead of just having the vampire, we actually can have several vampires. So they're very specific. This is the vampire of Black Bay. Uh -huh. And so you could fight him or maybe a different vampire, and each vampire will have his own different stats and abilities. And so it's kind of cool, adds to the flavor. We wanted the, the deck building game to have kind of a larger, uh, more epic scale and scope. So rather than, uh, you know, a board game of A Touch of Evil is we're playing in this town and we're fighting one villain that's besieging the town. Instead, this is a, a large group of heroes fighting to save the countryside from a huge group of... Uh, uh, villains that are attacking. <laughs> well, the game is uh, is basically sort of cooperative and competitive because uh, you're you're all working together to try to defeat the villains before the countryside falls to shatter. So that's the cooperative working together. Either the villains uh -huh. are going to win or the heroes are going to win. But once you determine the villains have won, the heroes won, you also can count up the uh, victory points or investigation points we do uh, at the end of the game and find out who won on an individual basis. Okay. Uh, so this basically gives our villains a very unique look, very different from the original A Touch of Evil, but, you know, very similar at the same time. So something familiar, but a new experience. That's sort of what we're bringing to it. And the, uh, the game itself is kind of like that as well. It's, uh, it's familiar themes, some familiar characters or villains, uh, but the game plays very differently, and you can actually play this. It's two to five players, but, you know, in a two-player game, you could play this game in a half an hour. So it's a, it's a different experience, and it depends on kind of what you want. But uh, so far, we've had really, really great uh, feedback from people that play A Touch of Evil. They're like, oh, wow, this is so much fun. It's kind of stuff I already know, but in a brand new way. And people that have never played A Touch of Evil are just like, whoa, this is a fun romp. So what's this A Touch of Evil board game all about? 
So it's uh, it's been really cool. I think this will act as kind of an introduction to uh, to our games for players that may not normally play board games. Maybe they would enjoy the card game and then find out more about our other stuff. Oh right, because yeah, you're all in the same universe. That's yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. A bad I think plan. it could be fun. But we're so addicted to it that at the end of each day here at the show. We actually have to bring the prototype copies to the hotel with us right. so we can play that night because we've been playing it every day. It was so hard to keep this a secret. We wanted to, uh, for the first time in a long time, have an actual surprise at Gen Con because in the internet age, there's no surprises anymore. You already know everything about a movie before it comes out. You already know right. about a game six months before you ever get to play it. We wanted to keep it all secret, and then day one of Gen Con on the show floor, here's something you've never even heard of, and you can play it, and you can pre-order it right here. And speaking of the pre-order, uh, I should tell people, we're gonna be, uh, we're doing the pre-order here at Gen Con, we're gonna be doing it at PAX, and also on our website soon. And the pre-order actually has a bonus villain pack, so if you buy it from us on the pre-order, you'll get a brand new villain, the Dryad of Harper's Wood, and her minions, the living trees. And uh, they're very cool, they add a lot to the game. And we wanted to have kind of a cool bonus exclusive for people that do the pre-order. Oh, that's nice. So the last thing I'll tell you about is Shadows of Brimstone. Ooh. So Shadows of Brimstone is very cool. This is a project that is our biggest project that we've ever done. Uh, now, we said this before with Fortune and Glory, and it was true at the time, but if you can believe it, this actually tops Fortune and Glory. Wow. Uh, we're keeping it a little bit secret right now because we want to build intrigue and mystery, but what we're telling people so far is the game is called Shadows of Brimstone, and as you can see from the artwork, it also reveals that the genre is Old West meets unspeakable horror. And we're telling people the type of game, it's a dungeon crawl adventure game. Really? Yes, it has aspects of light role playing, uh, you'll be able to uh, play as character types rather than just a certain character. So we'll have character classes like uh, Lawman or Bandito rather than, you know, Sheriff Anderson. It's like a Lawman. And you could actually have a group of adventurers, maybe four people play and all four of them are Lawmen if you want. So huh. you're making your own character and those characters can progress and get more experience and, and flesh out their character from game to game. So it's a different experience from what we normally do, and we've been working on this for about three years. The stuff is amazing. I wish I could show more of it. We're just trying to keep our, our, uh, our hand close to the chest just a little bit so that we can reveal tidbits leading up to the uh, Kickstarter, which is starting this October. So the website is shadowsofbrimstone.com, and if you log into there, we're going to be revealing more and more artwork and tidbits uh, as we get closer to the uh, to the October Kickstarter. We want to get people totally jazzed about it and start strong. And we're hoping for you know for our first Kickstarter to be very successful. And uh, just to just to get the word out to make sure, you know, we wouldn't do a Kickstarter unless this was going to be a massive project that we otherwise couldn't do justice to. You know, uh -huh. we've talked about it for a while, and Kickstarter is very hot right now. Everybody and his brother is doing a Kickstarter, but we're like, well, maybe Kickstarter is more for people who are just trying to get into it. Does that even work for us? We're an established game company who's doing games and whatever. But when we're looking at this project, we weren't going to be able to do everything we actually wanted to do for it. Because, like with all of our games, we want to put as much into it as we possibly can. Right. And even from what little I've said about the game so far, we probably can see all of the different possibilities of the directions it can go, and, and you know all the lines of miniatures, new classes, new exploration areas, and board sections, and, uh, and villains to fight, and all this stuff. So uh, we want to run in every direction, uh, you know, a million miles. But there's the reality of like, well, what can we afford to do, and you know, where does that fit into this, the rest of our product lines, and like, how can we actually do this? But with a successful Kickstarter we can make it huge. We can just take all kinds of goodness in there. And that's what we're trying to do. So nice. uh, please come check us out this October on Kickstarter, Shadows of Brimstone from Flying Frog Productions. Okay, well, Scott, I appreciate you talking to me and let me know what's going on here with uh, Flying Frog. And uh, have a good rest of the show. Sounds great. You too. We need more power.